we don't touch base at all. I mean, all of you. Good morning, everyone. With great honor, I welcome all of you to Dr. H.R. Bharadwaj Memorial Lecture. Before we commence the lecture, I invite your attention to a video commemorating the inspiring life and achievement of legendary Dr. H.R. Bharadwaj. One of India's foremost lawmakers, late Dr. Hansraj Bhardwaj. Born in the village of Gari Sampla, district Rotak, Haryana, Dr. Bhardwaj had a humble beginning. Born to Sri Jagannath Prasad, a police officer, and Srimati Sarti Devi, a homemaker. Dr. Bhardwaj's father, Sri Jagannath Prasad, was an integral part of the security detail for India's first Prime Minister, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. This gave young Hansraj a ringside view and a close understanding of the ongoing process of nation building. His father often spoke of the great virtues of Prime Minister Nehru. Pandit Nehru's ideology of a progressive and an inclusive India inspired Dr. Bhardwaj to become an active supporter of the Indian National Congress. Swami Vivekanand was one of the major influences that shaped his worldview. Dr. Bhardwaj completed his schooling from Gaur School, Rotak, and then graduated from BM College, Shimla. He also studied at the Agra University and the Punjab University, completing his master's, LLB degree, and doctorate. He was multilingual and spoke fluently in several languages, including Hindi, Urdu, Gurmukhi, and English. Dr. Bhardwaj also had great depth of knowledge about the teachings of religious scriptures and spirituality. In 1960-61, he completed his LLB, enrolled with the Bar Council of Delhi as an advocate and commenced his legal practice, primarily focusing on criminal trials and appellate work. Dr. Bhardwaj soon established himself as an outstanding defense counsel and appeared in historic criminal cases of the time, including the Dr. Vidya Jain murder case and the Golcha murder case. Emerging as a legal authority on various aspects of criminal and election law, Dr. Bhardwaj got further drawn into politics and became legal advisor to late Srimati Indira Gandhi. In 1971, he was appointed as additional public prosecutor in Delhi. Driven by a strong sense of duty and patriotism, he even spent time at the Indo-Pak border in 1971 serving the community and aiding relief efforts. Upon his return, Dr. Bhardwaj defended Srimati Indira Gandhi before the Shah Commission, Sri Sanjay Gandhi in Kissa Kursika, Chaudhary Bansilal and Sri Vidya Charan Shukla, among many other stalwarts, building a reputation of a fearless and meticulous legal counsel. In May 1981, he was personally asked by Srimati Indira Gandhi to accompany Sri Rajiv Gandhi to Amethi for filing his nomination papers for the upcoming Amethi Lok Sabha by-election. In 1982, Dr. Bhardwaj became a member of Rajya Sabha from the state of Madhya Pradesh. As a young parliamentarian, he participated in several debates, including the debate of vote of thanks to the presidential address. In 1984, in his capacity as member of parliament, at these dark times of the tragic Bhopal gas tragedy, Dr. Bhardwaj, along with Justice Bhagwati, personally attended to and visited victims, organized humanitarian and relief efforts. 
Over the years, Dr. Bhardwaj continued to publicly support for compensation for the victims and families of the Bhopal gas tragedy, both in the media and in Parliament. In January 1985, he was appointed as Minister of State for Law and Justice in the Cabinet of Sri Rajiv Gandhi. He had the distinction of being the only minister whose portfolio was not changed for the entire tenure of the government. In 1988, he was once again elected to the Rajya Sabha from Madhya Pradesh. In 1991, he was called on to take charge as Minister of State for Planning and Programme Implementation Independent Charge in the government of Sri P. V. Narsimha Rao and was later reappointed as Minister of State for Law and Justice. In the wake of liberalization, to make India a global hub for alternative dispute resolution, Dr. Bhardwaj envisaged adopting a mechanism of institutional arbitration. In 1995, Dr. Bhardwaj founded ICADR, the International Centre for Alternative Dispute Resolution under the aegis of the Law Ministry and Chief Patronage of the Chief Justice of India. An authority on election law, Dr. Bhardwaj was entrusted with integral matters for the Indian National Congress. In the year 2000, he accompanied Srimati Sonia Gandhi for the filing of her Lok Sabha nomination papers for Amethi as her authorized representative. In 2004, he facilitated the Lok Sabha nomination of Srimati Sonia Gandhi and Sri Rahul Gandhi, filed from Raibareli and Amethi. Having built a reputation and global standing as a legal authority, in May 2004, Dr. Bhardwaj was appointed as Cabinet Minister for Law and Justice and remained as such till May 2009. In June 2009, Dr. Bhardwaj was called upon to assume the constitutional post of Governor for the state of Karnataka. In 2012, Dr. Bhardwaj was given additional charge as Governor of Kerala. As Union Minister for Law and Justice, Dr. Bhardwaj was widely credited for upholding separation of powers and judicial autonomy and independence. Recognized as one of India's top legal minds, Dr. Bhardwaj was instrumental in key legislative reforms including women's right to property, the right to information, rights and privileges for judges, reservation for women in parliament and the judiciary, access to justice and digitization of the judicial system. He was also actively involved in the enactment of several new legislations including the Anti-Defection Law and the Prohibition of Benami Transaction Act 1988. Dr. Hansraj Bhardwaj authored several books covering a spectrum of topics related to governance. Dr. Bhardwaj always emphasized the importance of education, secularism and institutional building. Some of the institutions he contributed to include ICADR, the present building of the Bar Council, Delhi, OP Jindal Global University on the 8th of March 2020, Dr. Hansraj Bhardwaj left for his heavenly abode, leaving behind his family to take forward his legacy as a lawyer, a scholar, a humanitarian, an educationist, and most of all, as a compassionate human being. With great honor, I invite our distinguished guests to commence the lecture by lighting the lamp and offering floral tribute to late Dr. H.R. Bharatwaj.
today we are gathered here to commemorate and pay tribute to the great work, life and contribution of Dr. H. R. Bharatwaj. I invite the founding Vice Chancellor, OP Jindal Global University and the founding Dean of Jindal Global Law School, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, to welcome the dignitaries on and off the dais. A very, very good morning to all of you. Um, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our very, very distinguished uh, Chief Guest, uh, Honorable Mr. Justice Arjun Sikri, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, International Judge of the Singapore International Commercial Court in Singapore, uh, for having accepted our invitation to deliver the Dr. H. R. Bharadwaj Memorial Lecture on the theme, Constitutionalism, Democracy and Rights, Role and Responsibilities of the Indian Judiciary. I also want to take this moment to extend a warm welcome to uh, the family members of um, Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj, to begin with his wife and his life partner, Mrs. Prafulla Lata Bharadwaj, his son, uh, Mr. Arun Bharadwaj, his grandson, Karan Bharadwaj, um, his, um, Mr. Bharadwaj's daughter-in-law, Pallavi Bharadwaj, and um, his another uh, grandson, uh, Gautam Bharadwaj. It is such a special moment for us to host all of them here on campus as we celebrate the life and contributions of um, Dr. H.R. Bharadwaj. Uh, for all the students and faculty who are present here, I want to really uh, recognize this moment for you to kind of understand what Mr. Bharadwaj is to our university. Some of you might already know the history, but I want to retrace this history so that it is imprinted in your mind. I had met Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj for the first time in my life, literally on 10th August 2006. At that time, I was organizing a conference in India International Center in Delhi. I was a faculty member in Hong Kong. The idea of wanting to build a university had already got into my mind. And I met Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj at his house, which is 14 Tuklak Road. And I met him to, he had already accepted the invitation. I came from Hong Kong and met him there. The conference was supposed to be held on 11th, 12th, and 13th of August, 2006. So the previous day, I had landed from Hong Kong and met him at his home. And that was the first time I met him. And in that first meeting itself, I told him that, listen, thank you for accepting this invitation to inaugurate the conference, but I really want to spend some time with you to talk about the idea of building a global university with the global law school as the first school in that university. Just imagine for a moment, at that moment, I had no knowledge or existence of Mr. Naveen Jindal. I simply met Mr. Bharadwaj for the first time on that day. In his typical characteristic style, he said, yes, sure, we will meet up. Um, we'll meet up anytime. And um, I said, I'm actually, I live in Hong Kong, but um, I can meet you just after the conference. So 11th, he was inaugurated the conference. I said, I'll, meet, I'll be able to meet you on 14th morning. And on that evening, I'm, I'll be returning to Hong Kong. He said, I'll give you 20 minutes you come over. So the conference was over and I landed up at his home on 14th August 2006. I met his wife for the first time on that day and what was supposed to be a 20 minute meeting lasted for three and a half hours. We talked and talked and talked and he began to ask so many questions about the idea and he was just absolutely inspiring. It was like a living history moment for me because he had this extraordinary memory, encyclopedic memory to trace so much of important critical information from the past and to connect it to the present and to relate it even to the future. So when I told him about the idea of building this university, he said, all right, let's do it. What do you need for this? And I'm like, this can't be true. When I'm here, I'm talking to an Indian politician and most of us have opinions about Indian politicians or politicians anywhere in the world. So here we are, he just said, let's do it. 
tell me what you need. And I said, you know, sir, I need three things. I need somebody who can make a substantial financial commitment. I need that person to do it in a not-for-profit manner. And I need that person to ensure academic freedom, autonomy, and independence to build a world-class university. And of course, he looked at me and said, I will get back to you. And I returned back to Hong Kong. As I said, Indian politicians, the chances of returning back or returning with this information was very less, at least from my standpoint at that time. I was, of course, wrong. A few months later, he called me and said he has set up a meeting for me with Mr. Naveen Jindal. And that was the most important and influential, you know, historical moment when I met Naveen on 31st October, our distinguished chancellor, on 31st October 2006, upon the introduction of Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj. As some of you may know, Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj and Mr. Sri O.P. Jindal were good friends, and Mr. Jindal, our own chancellor and benefactor, looks up to Mr. Bharadwaj, and I can easily say that the rest is history. Since that day and moment, not only Mr. Bharadwaj contributed towards persuading and convincing Mr. Jindal in investing in the idea of this university, but all through his tenure as law minister, supported the evolution of this institution from its early origins, including the passing of the legislation of the university on 27 January 2009, including approval and recognition from the Bar Council of India in its early stages, and of course, ensuring that we are all set to begin the doors of this university. He kept coming here, inspiring us, and constantly supporting us in all our endeavors. I still very vividly remember on 30th September 2019, as we were celebrating the 10th anniversary of this university, we had Mr. Bharadwaj and his wife, Mrs. Bharadwaj, here on campus, and they were the chief guest and guests of honor for that event. Today is actually a very special day. Of course, we are celebrating the life and contribution of Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj, but as it is, it is also an extraordinary day when so many other good things we are celebrating. Today is Tamil New Year's Day. It's Pana Sankrati, which is Odia New Year. It's Bihu, which is Assamese New Year. It's also Ambedkar Jayanti, the, uh, of course, the, the birth uh, day of uh, the ch chairman of the drafting committee of the Constitutional Assembly. We also are celebrating Baisakhi. Tomorrow we'll be celebrating Vishu, Malayali New Year, Nababarsha, which is Bengali New Year, and also later Vallabhacharya Jayanti. So there is an extraordinary conglomeration of so many wonderful things that these days are. But for us at OP Jindal Global University, nothing is more significant and important than the celebration of the life and contribution of Sri H.R. Bharadwaj. He was an extraordinary man in terms of his accomplishments, had a very modest beginning, but if you look at the trajectory of his life and contribution, he made immense contribution in advancement of law and justice, but also institutions. Some of the things that he has done, which has not been adequately even mentioned, even in this movie, he had a significant contribution to the establishment of the National Law School Bengaluru, but also other national law schools in India. He also contributed to the establishment of the uh, National Judicial Academy, Bhopal. Somebody who had a very keen interest and commitment towards building institutions, nurturing institutions, supporting the evolution and development of these institutions. Something that I can also proudly say that during the time that Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj was law minister, not only he made sure that the so-called Lakshman Rekha between the role and responsibilities of what the judiciary is and what the legislature and executive ought to be. Some of the best relationships with proper respect for institutions, but also each operating in their own domain and recognizing the boundaries, but also accepting the responsibilities was reflected in his tenure as the law minister. I also want to mention that uh, Mr. Bharadwaj has a, had a keen sense of history. His contributions in the larger context of India's 75 years of independence has been truly remarkable. 
we are indeed very fortunate that our institutional lives overlapped and all of us have been part of that extraordinary decision and commitment and support that he rendered which culminated in the establishment of OP Jindal Global University. I also want to mention that today this university since its early origins with 100 students and 10 full-time faculty members and 20 administrative staff when it opened the doors of it on 30th September 2009 we have come a long way. Today we are a community of over 10,000 plus students over a thousand plus full-time faculty nearly 2,000 plus administrative staff and of course from our early origins of having only four classrooms and 100,000 square feet of built-up space we have nearly 4 million square feet of built-up space we have over 8,000 alumni all of which has been possible because of the extraordinary contribution of one man whose life we are celebrating today that is Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj. In no small measure I must say that Mrs. Bharadwaj also contributed during those discussions in 14th Uklak Road. I shall never forget those difficult moments, those extraordinary challenges, the regulatory challenges, many barriers and obstacles that we had to overcome, many trials and tribulations that we faced during all those times Mrs. Bharadwaj and Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj were the beacon of hope. They gave us faith and believed in the destiny that we were about to travel and they traveled with us together. We are indeed fortunate that we have been able to institute this endowed memorial lecture here at OP Jindal Global University and I am very thankful and grateful to the family of Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj for joining us on this very special occasion. Let me take a moment to welcome our distinguished chief guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Arjun Sikri. Justice Sikri, of course, does not need any introduction in a formal sense, which my colleague will do. But I want to say that among the few illustrious people who supported us in our early endeavors, Justice Sikri was one among them. Way back in 2008, when we were acquiring land and the idea of building this university was barely among a few people with Mr. Jindal and of course Mr. Bharadwaj, Justice Sikri was one of them who believed in this vision long before the world discovered us. I would go to his home and engage with him in conversations, kept him updated and believe it or not, he spoke at several of our conferences and seminars held during 2008 and 9, long before the establishment of the campus and the university in Delhi at the India Habitat Center, at the India International Center, just believing that this will indeed happen. Such was his generosity and magnanimity that he believed in the vision and supported us all through our endeavors. He has been a true champion of institution building, somebody who is deeply committed to the protection of the rule of law and promotion of access to justice. Somebody who has had a very strong academic bent of mind which he brought to bear as a judge in his immensely significant judgments and jurisprudence who, which has developed over the years. One of the important things that he did besides many other things is that the concept of human dignity deeply personified in the constitution has been one of his unique contributions and there are many such contributions. We are indeed grateful to Honorable Mr. Justice Arjun Sikri for accepting our invitation but also to hugely support us in our earlier endeavors and of course to remain a champion through our journey. Thank you, sir, for taking this time out and to be with us. We are deeply grateful to you for accepting our invitation. Thank you to all of you, faculty members, students and staff. This moment is very special as we express our deep sense of gratitude and appreciation to the man that brought us together, the man who brought us to this Sony path together, the man who brought all of us together. I want to end by asking you to think for a moment, the students in particular. Let's think about five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and the faculty even who have come from 49 countries in the world, the students who have come from 45 countries in the world. Just imagine a decade ago if somebody had told you that a decade later, five years later, 
you will be students or faculty in a place called Sonipat in Jagdishpur village in the state of Haryana. Would you have believed it? And you simply wouldn't have. That's exactly what has happened to all of us. And that was because of one man, Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj, who was ready to reimagine the future of higher education, legal education, was able to equally share and convince and indeed appreciate the contribution of the Jindal family and indeed to join hands essentially with our founding chancellor and benefactor, Mr. Naveen Jindal, for building this university. Thank you to Mr. Bharadwaj and his entire family for making this contribution which has brought us all together. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raj. Now I invite Professor Dr. S.G. Srijit, the Executive Dean of the Jindal Global Law School, to share his thoughts on the relevance of discussing this topic here today. Uh, Honorable uh, Justice Sikri, the Chief Justice, uh, the Chief Guest of the Day, my apologies, Chief Guest of the Day, uh, distinguished members, uh, from the H.R. Bharadwaj family, distinguished faculty colleagues, and my dearest students who took their time from the classes to attend this event, perhaps with no reciprocal expectations, but the knowledge which you're going to get from this lecture. A very good morning to all of you. The topic of today's lecture, which will be delivered by Justice Sikri, is constitutionalism, democracy, and rights, uh, role and responsibilities of Indian judiciary. I would try to set a background from a proletarian perspective. I'm not a professor of constitutional law, but I'm a devotee of the Constitution of India. Every reading of the Constitution is a pilgrimage into our own aspirations as a nation. We live in an age of constitutionalism. We often use this terminology. What does it mean to live in the age of constitutionalism? I would try to take a less sanguine picture uh, of it. This is an age of mistrust. This is an age of uncertainties. This is an age of unpredictabilities. And we find evanescing values all around us. But is it fair really to define constitutionalism, no matter proletarian or no matter uh, erudite, uh, a, a way like this? What I'm trying to convey is that this is a time when we witness the Constitution on an unprecedented trial. But it probably is also an invitation to complete what L.M. Sinkhvi called the unfinished tasks of the Constitution of India. But what we generally find is that there is a mounting fear along with the mistrust in all of us. And this mounting fear is that we are going to lose something. There is no enemy over there. Probably it's, we are just shadow boxing with our own misunderstandings. But there is something which makes us deeply uncomfortable. That's what I've called as we live in a fear of losing uh, something. There is no enemy, as I've mentioned. But probably we sense we live in shaky foundations. Our own self is becoming so alien to us and so hostile towards itself. But at the same time, we feel that in a never before manner, we find some consolation in reading the Constitution. I've mentioned that for me, every reading of the Constitution is a pilgrimage to my own ontology, to my own self, to my own foundations as a citizen of uh, this country. But this is a faith in our own collective aspirations, which we actually codified in the form of the Constitution of India way back in 1950. Now, the, all these are manifesting in s some action, in some form of action. We have started to courageously re-examine the foundations of the Constitution of India, an originalist approach. Uh, in a historical sense that we now today uh, love reading the constituent assembly debates to understand what exactly we uh, convey to the state at that point to give us the idea of India. We sense in scholarship so many angry voices. You might have read some of them, but I'm, I would just like to take the liberty since there are a lot of students here uh, to name some of them. Tripur Daman Singh, Akar Singh Rathor, Madhav Khosla, Abhinav Chandrachud, Chintan Chandrachud, Rohan Alva, Gautam Bhatia, you are yet to find a women's name there, even though something has been written on the women by Achyut Chetan, the founding mothers of the Indian constitution, a book that absolutely helped us break all kind of semantic fixations with the term founding fathers of Indian constitution. Indian constitution is also a creation of the founding mothers. 
a new voice has been given to us. Now, what did these people reflect on? The anger was primarily about the mistrust. The anger was primarily about the lack of incoherence. What they tried to do was that they tried to reflect seriously on our own foundations. Their themes of reflection ranged from the founding moments of Indian constitution, the idea of India, the founding mothers of Indian constitution, first amendment to the constitution, conceptual foundations of article 14 and article 21, and most importantly, re-examining the colonial foundations of a system. To the extent they have not spared the basic structure doctrine by revisiting the basic structure moment to see that is it all worth or not. So it's not that less sanguine as I've presented. It's a time when we have started to display a courage in a never before manner, a courage to ask questions. So this is not really a bad time. There could be a shift from individual from, from people the collectivity to individual, the citizen. The citizen has started to assume some kind of importance. This is what Gautam Partia calls that. Gautam Partia refers as to the major shift from subjects to citizens. Now we are people, not the collective, but individuals with a certain voice. We have assumed a new type of a speech, often daring to say, what we want about our own future. And it's quite heartening to see that the government of India has now given us the vision, how do we spend or how do we envision India at 2047? It's a great opportunity for the people of India to inform the government what type of the future we expect at 2047. It's gonna be the people's idea of India. It's good to see government making such a turn at the 75th year that the last quarter will be sent in terms of reflecting on what kind of India we wanted. and if. It's not the type of India which we have, which, which the founding fathers of the constitution have dreamed. Let's reclaim that India which were there in their original imaginations. In sum, I would conclude by saying that constitution is nothing but, sorry, constitutionalism is a sentiment. Constitutionalism is also a means actually to reclaim whatever that ought to have been. And constitutionalism is also a way to participate in this continuing reality making process. I'm sure Justice Sikri will tell you more about how the Supreme Court of India, which is the manifestation of uh, the Indian judiciary, will try to actualize this reality and gift us this world which we are dreaming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Our chief guest, Honorable Justice Sikri, is a person who requires no introduction. He was a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, the international judge in Singapore International Commercial Court. Just the Sikri's contribution to Indian jurisprudence, like Professor Raj just said, is uncomparable. For some, some instances, some fine instances of his contributions would be the CJI impeachment case, the constitutionality of Aadhaar, right to privacy, and the list goes on and on. Mr. Sikri, we consider it a great honor to have you in our midst. With great pride and privilege, I invite Honorable Mr. Justice Arjun K. Sikri to deliver the HR Bharadwaj Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much and good morning to all of you. Mrs. Praful Lata Bhardwaj, wife of Dr. Bhardwaj, <laughs> in whose memory we have assembled here today. His family members, including Arun, Karan, Pallavi, Gautam. My dear friend, I can say, now Professor C. Rajkumar, your worthy Vice Chancellor, Mr. Dr. Srijit, other persons sitting on the dais, staff members, and my dearest students. It is indeed a pleasure given to me to deliver this lecture today. And uh, Professor Srijit has already given a wonderful introduction, the way he has introduced the concept of constitutionalism. Of course, I'll develop on that and uh, will like to give my uh, opinion about what constitutionalism means according to me. But before that, 
Let me first congratulate Jindal Global Law School for instituting this memorial lecture in the honor of Dr. Hans Raj Bhadwaj, a great son and a legendary legal luminary whose sterling qualities we shall reminisce together and we have been doing so ever since this function started. You have seen in the documentary about his life which was played here and uh, the accomplishments, uh, the way Professor Rajkumar in his inimitable style uh, discussed. Actually, if I say he played a very significant role not only in the establishment of this university but also in nurturing and nourishing it as well. He was a true friend, guide and philosopher of this university. There could not have been a better way to express your gratitude by launching this lecture series in his fond memory. That apart, the university is not simply a center for learning and sharing different thoughts, but it also a place where we collectively share in silence great memories of masters and their works. And remember, as Edmund Burke does, and I quote, a disposition to preserve and an ability to improve taken together <coughs> would be my standard of a statesman. Dr. Bhardwaj proved himself truly to this statement. He was not just a great political statesman, but was also a great legal luminary too. In a legal and political career spanning over five decades, Dr. Bhardwaj donned many hats and was widely credited for possessing an acute appreciation of the intersection between law and politics. Actually, this was a very rare trait which I saw personally and very closely in him. And let me tell you, and that is another reason which uh, I have said uh, in my lecture, uh, that uh, he is one person, and uh, uh, Professor Rajkumar also reflected on that, who could really see how executive and judiciary can go together hand in hand, of course, at the same time, maintaining their own distinct personalities and uh, judiciary, maintaining its own, uh, 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 this uh, uh, attitude of uh, being independent and uh, as an independent judiciary. Uh, he is one person I saw who never spoke uh, uh, ill will, uh, 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 he had no ill will or never spoke bad about or Paul Mouthed as well as judiciary is concerned. I have seen many debates in parliament happening where uh, the, uh, I mean, many speakers, um, uh, MPs and many times ministers also, I don't want to name many big persons in the uh, uh, field who would speak so much against judiciary when their turn comes. But he is one person I saw who always defended the judiciary. He always maintained that it is the judiciary, the independence of judiciary, which will be able to uh, uh, protect the constitution and the rule of law in this country and therefore we have to respect. Second thing, if I may say so, and that is at personal level, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Rajkumar mentioned that when he would go to 14 Akbar Road, uh, sorry, Tuglad Road, at his residence and how this uh, uh, entire idea of uh, uh, conceptualizing of this university and creation of this university came about. I was hardly three houses away at 8 Tuglak Road because the numbers are uh, odd and even so 8, 10, 12, 14 like that. So and most of the times I remember Professor Rajkumar after meeting uh, Dr. Bhadwaj would come to me and we will discuss what he has discussed and how this progress etc. It, it has been made. And I know the kind of contribution which he has already said Professor uh, Dr. Bhadwaj uh, gave and it is because of him that this university exists. But apart from that at personal level which I was telling that 
in most of the functions whenever we would be there he was one person who was very fond of me for whatever reason i don't know and uh, uh, while speaking and uh, on the dais when there are 400 500 people are there uh, 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 in the audience he would name that you you should learn from uh, justice sikri the way he is doing and i keep going to various countries i have traveled a lot he is known everywhere people know him and we know we we, uh, we need judges of this kind who have created their impression throughout the world i don't know whether i deserve these comments or not but what i am saying in a totally different manner that this was his fondness for me and therefore i really uh, i am thankful uh, to uh, Uh, uh the organizers professor uh, uh, rajkumar in particular and this university that you have given me chance uh, i have in my lecture said about his life further things also but i am uh, omitting that for the, uh, to save time because that has already been said a lot has been said and i don't want to repeat about his life but uh, uh, i i would say and because of that i am saying that i am thankful to this university for giving me this chance to deliver the first lecture in the memory of dr bhardwaj i deem it an honor uh, that it is an honor given to me it is also because of reasons which i have told you and uh, uh, coming to the topic why i have chosen i have consciously chosen this topic uh, on the theme constitutionalism democracy and rights role and responsibility of indian judiciary uh it is i say a befitting tribute to dr bhardwaj because <laughs> he believed in constitutionalism and i have seen of course he was uh, much uh, older than me in age but uh, ever since uh, i joined the profession and uh, i came to know about him i have seen the way he matured in the politics and in uh, the legal profession also and his golden period was uh, f- uh, as law minister from 2004 of course he had many other accomplishments uh, as well prior to that which uh, were told to you but uh, what i feel is that 2004 was a year when he became from only a politician to a statesman and that was a period where he uh, i mean across political lines he thought of the country he thought of nation you have seen earlier he had uh, fought many cases because being a congress person naturally as a political person and when you are a lawyer you will do those cases for those persons who need you in your party and he had done many of those cases apart from uh, the 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 uh, big criminal trials and uh, the murder trials which uh, you were uh, informed about but this era era of 2004 to 2009 when i said that he was beyond much much beyond he had uh, risen to that level uh, from the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, i would say the uh, shallowness of that politics and no uh, across party lines he was thinking of the country and the way and that was a time when naturally uh, he met uh, professor rajkumar and the manner in which Uh, he uh, ensured that uh, this university comes into being and uh, therefore i say that this was the era when he imbibed him himself and rather this maybe was earlier also but it came to the fore and uh, in a great measure about the constitutionalism and about the democracy in this country and what the role of judiciary should be <coughs> in enforcing that and that was the reason i said that i uh intentionally i i thought that this would be a topic which would be a befitting tribute me and dr rajkumar we discussed about it and uh, we selected this uh, topic uh i may say that a constitution of any country is the highest law of nation as we all students of law we know it and it is also known as grund norm it is the instrument of governance of nation state with its defined objectives and institutions established to accomplish those objectives india adopted its constitution as we know on 26 january 1950 which is given by the people of republic of india to themselves that is why it starts with the momentous words we the people in modern democratic nation state owes 
owes its origin to what we call social contract theory. That social contract theory means where the people come together instead of having a jungle raj or uh, where uh, even uh, not even monarchy, but then people come together. They think they that look. Let us have somebody who will govern us, but we will elect those people. And that is where the origin of this is called social contract, which was the theory propounded by uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, uh, and later on improved by um, uh, various other political thinkers. And uh, so therefore, it is in order to uh, avoid anarchy and the conditions of might is right to avoid that. Human beings come together and create what he called, uh, Thomas called, uh, commonwealth or state. And uh, he described uh, it as a uh, common power as the great Leviathan in his book. Uh, if you read that book, uh, very, uh, I mean, interestingly, that theory of social contract which uh, he has given. But over a period of time, it got transformed into a democratic state where people choose their representative and give those representatives power to govern. This is achieved by electoral process where elections are to be held in a free and fair manner. It gives rise to majority rule that is a political party which gets the majority is treated as chosen representative of the people with right to govern. This is the essence of democracy. However, here a big caveat. That does not mean that majority has a right to rule in any manner it wants. Every good system of democracy also command that the elected government should follow certain well-recognized precepts. These include following the legal norms and rules, because rule of law applies to the elected representatives also. More importantly, respecting human rights, like freedom of speech, right of equality, right to life and liberty, ensuring certain rights to ethnic and other minorities, adhering to the principles of democracy, thereby giving voice to the opposition as well, that is right to defend, whereas majority rule by the elected government is known as formal aspect of democracy, enshrining the aforesaid values makes it a substantive or a liberal democracy. All these facets become part of a robust constitution and these are described as constitutionalism. So constitution is one aspect, but when we have these aspects included in any constitution, because there may be constitution of any country, we know constitution of our neighboring countries in 60 or 70 years which have undergone uh, or have been repealed and come again and again four or five times. Even a monarch or even a dictator may come with a constitution, but that would be a formal and there may be a process of election on the on papers only. That may be an aspect of formal democracy, but if we want liberal democracy, then all these attributes are to be there in a constitution to make it a uh, liberal democracy and that is what is called and I would say at least that is what is constitutionalism. Now at the same time, <coughs> principle of constitutionalism ensure that the government acts within the sphere of powers allocated to it in a constitutional framework and does not breach limits of powers prescribed in the constitution. This brings the necessity of governance by rule of law, which essentially tells that the society is to be governed by law and not by whims of those who govern and that the law is supreme. Even those who govern are bound by law and have to act within the confines of law. Notwithstanding such a scheme in any constitution, there may be tendency on the part of those who govern uh, to assume the role of dominance to which I will come little later. So in order to ensure that rule of law prevails, a good constitution also ensures that all powers are not given in the hands of one institution. Although, as I told you about Hobb, Hobb conceived of that and that is why I said that this theory was improved uh, upon by uh, political thinkers thereafter and they thought that no, it should not be in the hand of one institution. And that is why normally in most of the constitution, including in Indian constitution, we have three wings or three institutions, legislature, executive and judiciary. What is important is that 
in order to ensure the adherence <coughs> to constitutional value or the constitutionalism, judiciary is to act independent of the other two institutions. An independent institution, task assigned to the judiciary is to become the final arbiter to decide whether any rights of the people are violated by government or government institutions. This is known as judicial review as we know it. And in many constitutions, including in the Indian constitution, this power of judicial review is not limited to only to the executive action, but it extends even to legislative acts as well. So therefore, if a particular act, even by the parliament or the state legislature, has been enacted, which violates the provisions of the constitution, Indian judiciary is given a power to invalidate, to declare that particular act uh, as unconstitutional, which is not the power even with the, the British judiciary. They are, the, uh, the, in a way, the, the, the uh, uh, legislature or the parliament is supreme. But here, all three institutions are given their powers, respective powers which are defined. We work on the principle of separation of powers, but at the same time, final arbiter and that is what the uh, constitution framers also gave and if you see the constitutional debate with uh, Professor Sejit also mentioned about they would say that look it is ultimately the judiciary which has to be decide which has to decide and because of these reasons uh, actually the uh, uh, the, 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 uh, and the topic which I have chosen the role of judiciary becomes so important in um, adhering or in rather in ensuring that constitutionalism which is there in the constitution prevails. So therefore in this lecture my endeavor is to mention how the constitution becomes a document of liberal democracy by incorporating precepts and principles of constitutionalism, how rule of law ensures the attainment of limited government where people are sovereign and ultimately how all these cherished values can be achieved only when there is an independent judiciary which is capable of discharging its functions without being influenced by the other two wings of the state. So therefore to facilitate this I have structured my lecture like this. In the first part I will uh, discuss the constitutional principles which are necessary to ensure liberal democracy that is constitutionalism. I shall here elucidate that though some of the constitutional values are necessary to achieve limited government to ensure liberty and human rights of the governed or though uh, that people uh, which are known as uh, the attributes of ne negative constitutionalism i'll tell you negative doesn't mean uh, in bad sense and uh, what negative constitutionalism is although i have mentioned all those uh, aspects so there is, uh, but what I am uh, what is important to note is, which I'll tell that there is also a positive aspect of constitutionalism, which puts obligation on the government to act in a manner which achieves social welfare, solidarity, economic equality, and social justice. Ultimate sovereignty, which lies with we the people who create a commonwealth or leviathan with sovereign powers. Such sovereignty by the state is to be exercised for the welfare of the people of the state. In part two, I will uh, demonstrate uh, how between the negative and positive aspect of constitutionalism lies the rule of law. Here my hypothesis is that two main functions of the judiciary are, although I have narrated but I am paraphrasing or, uh, uh, it now, number one, to protect the democracy by enforcing rule of law and uh, which is known as negative constitutionalism and number two to bridge the gap between the law and the society thereby helping the other two wings of the state uh, with the positive attributes of the constitutionalism then i'll move on to part three i'll narrate the role that is assigned to indian judiciary under the constitution and in part four how i, I will uh, give a brief uh, count of how in last 75 years indian judiciary has uh, uh, been able to play this role and how effectively it has played this role and ultimately i'll end with some of my conclusions so coming to the uh, first part, constitutionalism, attributes of a better governance and welfare state. That is what I say. These 
aspects of constitutionalism are attributes of better governance and welfare state i have told you up to now and in my uh, 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 brief uh, introduction that uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 uh, other aspects of the uh, constitution or a robust constitution are uh, respecting human rights like freedom of speech right to equality right to life liberty etc now these are known as negative uh, attributes of constitutionalism negative doesn't mean that they have something bad in it rather it is all good in it negative in the sense that look the uh, when we talk of limited government that the government uh, the, uh, is there to uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, it is to be ensured that government or those who govern in a democracy even if they are elected members they do not impinge upon these rights so in that sense from the governance point of view it is in that sense is a negative role that please don't tread into this and if you do that you violate that yes judiciary has to come forward and enforce those rights so those attributes which i said uh, are uh, 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 as i mentioned are uh, treated as negative uh, uh, attributes and on the other hand uh, there are positive attributes as well but before that let me here although i have mentioned about the constitutionalism but i like to quote uh, 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 barnett uh, who has explained in his book the doctrine of constitutionalism and he has said this and i quote a uh, these are the uh, he he says that are the attributes uh, a the exercise of power be within the limits legal limits conferred by parliament on those with power the concept of intra virus and those whose exercise uh, exercise powers are accountable to law b the exercise of power irrespective of legal authority must conform to the notion of respect for the individual and the individual citizens rights c the powers conferred on institutions within a state whether legislative executive or judicial but sufficiently dispersed between the various institutions so as to avoid the abuse of power and d that the government in formulating policy and the legislature in legitimating uh, that policy is accountable to the electorate on whose trust the power is held so point a which i have mentioned above and uh, it is uh, uh, one can say that it enshrines the principles of rule of law that they have to act as rule, uh, uh, as per the law point b which is uh, talked by barnett it talks about the human rights and fundamental rights of the citizens based on the notion of dignity this brings back to the notion of liberty uh, which is the back bedrock of social contract theory which i pointed out point c mentioned above it ensures that power is not to be given in the hands of one institution but it needs to be distributed uh, in three institutions as i mentioned it earlier and it also talks of separation of powers as well as checks and balances and point d which was uh, 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 which barnett says uh, what i feel is it talks of democratic governance in which elected representatives are accountable to people and that is very very important in this manner it contains not only principle of public trust but also gives a message that the term of elected representative is limited where after they have to go back to the electorate to seek fresh mandate and it is the people to elect this uh, it is for the people to elect the same government or bring about a new government this recognizes that sovereignty lies in the hands of we the people now i told you uh, 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 here uh, the uh, uh, aspects which i told you and i said that negative constitutionalism but what is positive constitutionalism let me uh, although i describe in brief but uh, elaborate uh, it a little bit uh, this post second world war many political thinkers have projected that uh, some other norms of constitutionalism they describe the aforesaid attributes which i said as uh, uh, about the rights of people etc and limited government uh, as negative constitutionalism and profess that the other side is uh, which is given the nomenclature of positive constitutionalism these 
proponents of positive constitutionalism have severely criticized negative constitutionalism as myopic and fundamentally flawed. They argued that negative constitutionalism requires an institutional structure that prevents or inhibits the states from acting. According to them, a state jacket negative constitutionalism serves to make it harder for a state to create a system of health care or undertake schemes to alleviate uh, poverty. In that sense, it prioritizes political position over other, which is against egalitarianism, uh, 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 and it is uh, uh, against the uh, very concept of democracy. That is what uh, they project. So on the aforesaid foundation, they argue that positive aspect of constitutionalism in a liberal democracy are also a part of constitutionalism, which include, as I said earlier, social welfare, solidarity, economic equality, and social justice. The holistic concept of constitutionalism, therefore, would not have only those attributes which limits the powers of the state, but also those qualities which create an institution, that is nation state, that leads to successful functioning of the state as a welfare state. Now, this is very interesting phenomena. On the one hand, we have in our constitution uh, rights, fundamental rights, etc., and many other rights eth uh, to, I mean, ethnic minorities, rights to opposition, which are given, which I said, the aspects of uh, liberal democracy. And they uh, enshrine the concept of limited government, that government is also to act within the rule of law. So therefore, what does it signify that it has to act in this manner that you don't, because it is the very basis of social contract theory. As I said earlier, Thomas Hobbes says that we come together and form uh, uh, this nation state for ourselves where we elect the person who will govern. But that doesn't mean that we have compromised or we, we have given our freedom or liberty at their hands. That would remain with us. We cherish that. So that is one part of the constitutionalism. And therefore, we tell the those who govern that, look, you are here to govern. Yes, law and order should be there. All those things are to be seen, but at the same time, not at the cost of our liberty, which we cherish, not at the cost of our freedoms, not at the cost of our fundamental rights. But then, is it the only form of governance? This is what positive constitutionalists say. No. When we talk of governance, we talk of welfare state, where the government is able to act for those who are marginalized section of the society, those who are uh, uh, poor, those who are uneducated. Therefore, for their welfare also, we should be uh, the government is the it becomes the duty of the government to act in that sense. So, therefore, that is also a part of constitutionalism and a very, very important part of democracy. So, therefore, it doesn't mean only the rule, but ruling in the manner or functioning in the manner that it acts as a welfare state. So, this, uh, 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 if I may say to sum up, that uh, both negative as well as positive aspects of constitutionalism are necessary for a vibrant democracy, and therefore they are essential elements of any uh, good uh, constitution. Now, <coughs> coming to the second part, rule of law, in this, uh, when we have defined the concept of constitutionalism in a democracy. So between the four set, two sets of constitutionalism comes the rule of law. Because once we talk of welfare state, let me tell you one thing here. There, if the if uh, the government has to function in a manner to elevate the poverty to come out with the welfare schemes for those who are marginalized section then we have to give powers also to the government at the same time to act so on the one hand we talk of limited government where the government power is curtailed in the sense when it comes to following the rule of law or when it comes to infringing the rights of the people but at the same time when it has to act as a welfare state, then we have to give them uh, uh, vast powers as well at the same time. But those powers are to be exercised for the welfare of the people and not for subjugation of their rights. This is what I would say is the essence of constitutionalism and it is achieved by virtue of rule of law, which I said in the beginning. Now, there are 
three aspects of uh, rule of uh, I, we all know and as law students you must have read uh, uh, how Dicey propounded the theory of rule of law. So there are three precepts, uh, uh, three aspects of the rule of law. Number one, a formal aspect which means making the law rule. Then a jurisprudential or doctrinal aspect which is concerned with the minimal conditions for the existence of law in a society. And third is the substantive aspect as per which the rule of law is concerned uh, uh, with properly balancing between the individual and the society. I talked again, I come back, I talked about the uh, negative and positive constitutionalism and the cases come before us. Aadhaar was one such case and where I have described in great detail in that judgment, maybe uh, for 15, 20 pages I have devoted to that only, that how on the one hand there may be individual rights, on the other hand there are rights of the society. So how to balance those? And that is where the function of rule of law comes and where that is where the function of constitution comes. There may be situations where on the one hand uh, one person says that my right is infringed under the constitution in the chapter relating to fundamental right. On the other hand, there is a class right or given to group or class people that may be a right given under the constitution and it appears that if uh, it is follow not followed that is infringed. So there is a conflict between the two law, two, two rights of an individual or there may be a situation conflicting uh, two rights in the same constitution. How to balance those? That is where uh, uh, when I come to the role of judiciary comes, of course. And uh, But we are at the stage of rule of law, I am explaining. And uh, uh, I would only quote from Justice Haran Barak. He is the former Chief Justice. They call it President of the uh, 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 of is Israel. And uh, he has uh, very um, lucidly explained this facet of rule of law. And I quote, the rule of law is not merely public order. The rule of law is social justice based on public order. The law exists to ensure proper social life. Social life, however, is not a goal in itself, but it means to allow the individual to live in dignity and develop himself. The human being and human rights underlie this substantive perception of the rule of law with a proper balance among the different rights and between human rights and the proper needs of society which I described uh, just now. The substantive rule of law is the rule of proper law which balances the needs of the society and the individual. This is the rule of law that strikes a balance uh, between society need for political independence, social equality, economic development and internal order on the one hand and the needs of the individual and his personal liberty and his human dignity on the other. The judge must protect this rich concept of the rule of law. <coughs> there is uh, an interesting relationship between the democracy and rule of law. Liberal democracy is invoked to put a check on the arbitrary powers. Likewise, the same uh, for same purpose, appeal to rule of law is also made. However, it is also a matter of fact that in a democracy, will of majoritarianism infuses the law by having it enacted. It is the majority which is in the parliament, they enact the law. Here, appeal to rule of law becomes an appeal to its supremacy over the wills of persons, however measured or agitated. In this essence, rule of law becomes an important tool for achieving liberal democracy as well as constitutionalism. As Bird put it, the democratic ideal, that is substantive democracy which I have said, confronts the perpetual possibility of internal contradiction deriving from its dual commitment to majority rule and to an anti-hierarchical principles <coughs> of non-domination. -domin Whenever a majority seeks to dominate a minority through a democratic process, democracy goes to war with itself. And in, this is what Sirijit also uh, uh, mentioned indirectly. An institutional mechanism is needed to resolve this conflict, which is supplied by conception of rule of law that entails a non-legislative body such as 
constitutional court continually to require the legislature to rethink and revamp policies that result in domination. And here, the, 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 the function, it comes on the, and it falls on the judiciary to enforce the rule of law in this particular manner. So how this judiciary is conceived under our Indian constitution. But before that, let me say, uh, without going into much detail, the students of constitutional law knows, but we have part three and part four of the constitution. Part three talks of fundamental rights. In a sense, part three, when it talks of fundamental rights, it brings about all the attributes of that negative constitutionalism which we want. And part four talks about directive principles of state policy. And it talks uh, and it brings about the concept of state welfareism. And therefore, both the attributes of this constitutional law or constitutionalism are very much present in our constitution. And uh, 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 the, the uh, role is given to the uh, judiciary to enforce it. And again, uh, I would uh, say that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, here, I may add one, uh, uh, sorry, let me come to that. The, uh, this aforesaid function, which is assigned to judiciary under the Constitution, uh, 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 this uh, uh, has all, uh, 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 sorry, I have already said all the attributes. So, uh, it, it, this is because of this reason, power of judicial review is given. But I must enter one caveat here. And that is very important. This is what uh, Professor Sirijit also mentioned. Making provision in a written constitution founded on social contract theory and aiming at limited government where the constitution is supreme and in that sense sovereign would not necessarily lead to achieving those goals. History has witnessed democratical, that democratically elected governments become despotic many times. We have the examples of Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy. India also saw emergency imposed on its people in 1975, taking away human rights and liberty of the people. When we scan through the histories of some of the democratic states governed by the constitution, governed by the constitution, the government elected by the people under the constitution, we find that in many countries, such democracies did not survive for long. It may be because of dictatorship, keeping in the form of fascism or military rule, military coups, we know, or other violent means were adopted to seize power. But today, that doesn't happen. Other types of means are adopted to endanger the democracy. In the famous book entitled, How Democracies Died, Die, How Democracies Die, Harvard professors Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, they observe, and I quote, and these are very profound words, democracies still die, even when the, uh, uh, the military coup, they don't happen. Democracies still die, but by different means. Since the end of the Cold War, most democratic breakdowns have been caused not by generals and soldiers but by elected governments themselves like uh, Chavez in Venezuela elected leaders have subverted democratic institutions in Georgia Hungary Nicaragua Peru the Philippines Poland Russia Sri Lanka Turkey Ukraine democratic blacklisting today begins at the ballot box Many government efforts to subvert democracy are legal, legal in inverted commas. The steps they are taken, they appear to be legal that the government is taking those steps in sense that they are approved by the legislature or accepted by the courts. They may even be portrayed as efforts to improve democracy. Keep in mind each word. This is very, very important making the judiciary more efficient, combating corruption, now, uh, 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 corruption or cleaning up the electoral process. They, 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 they are portrayed like this, that we are trying to do it. Newspapers still publish, but are bought off. Or bullied into self-censorship. Citizens 
continue to criticize the government but often find themselves facing tax or other legal troubles this shows public confusion people do not immediately realize realize what is happening many continue to believe that they are living under a democracy in 2011 when uh, latin or bonetto survey asked venezuelans to rate their own country from 1 not at all democratic to 10 completely democratic 51% of the respondents gave their country a score of 8 or higher because there is no single moment no coup declaration of martial law or suspension of the constitution in which the regime obviously crosses the line into dictatorship nothing may set off society's alarm bells those who denounce government abuse may be dismissed as exaggerating or crying wolf democracy erosion is for many almost imperceptible now this is happening in many countries and this is where constitutionalism or a dem- uh, i mean liberal democracy becomes so important and so cherished so in order to ensure that a force situation does not occur democracies have to be strong backed by a strong civil society at the same time it has also to be ensured that constitution is defended by democratic norms with the aid of rule of law robust norms have to be in place to ensure constitutional checks and balances therefore for liberal to emerge and flourish and for good governance leading to welfare state we need the state and the laws at the same time it is also necessary that both state and the society must be strong a strong state is needed to control violence and force laws provide public service that are critical for a life in which people are empowered to make and pursue their choices and to achieve a welfare state on the other hand a strong society is also needed to control and shackle the strong state to achieve these targets rule of law is essential and for proper enforcement of rule of law requirement of a strong and independent judiciary becomes paramount here comes the role of strong independent judiciary for would be authoritarians judiciary judicial and law enforcement agency pose a challenge it is to be born in mind that even well designed constitutions cannot by themselves guarantee democracy in the first instance constitutions are incomplete in the sense that they cannot anticipate all possible contingencies or prescribe how to behave under all possible circumstances secondly constitutional rules are also subject to competing interpretations therefore it becomes the paramount function of the judiciary to take care of situation when they occur in furtherance of democratic constitutionalism by enforcing rule of law now this line which i have said constitutional rules are also subject to competing interpretations so this is if you uh, i don't know many of uh, you may have heard one of the professors uh, saying a uh, few days ago uh, that uh, look there is a danger that if institution uh, this constitution may not be interpreted in a theocratic manner and uh, uh, in co- uh, uh, course uh, although i don't uh, subscribe to that i i feel and as i have seen the indian judiciary has uh, i mean acted and has always uh, whenever there was a challenge and it has emerged triumphant and it has even there were some periods which were low periods in the history of indian judiciary but thereafter they have bounced back and i am uh, very confident that the situation would not arise but there is always a danger and that is why how independent and uh, fearless judiciary is needed in this country and i said to discharge those twin functions number 1 to uh protect the democracy and rule of law and number 2 to bridge the gap between the law and the society that becomes a very very important aspect of uh, the, the uh, 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 function of uh, the indian judiciary and therefore now what is and how it is to be discharged and how it has happened because 
of lack of time i will not take uh, there's much to say uh, in last 75 years how it is i will tell um, uh, dr rajkumar that he can uh, circulate uh, my paper on this but will only simply say two or three things and first is i want to comment upon the judgment of the indian supreme court on uh, in the case of uh, keshwanand bharti i am saying so and i have chosen this case because i i am saying very frankly unfortunately one of the highest dignitaries of the nation had criticized the judgment about a month or two months ago and a befitting reply was given by our chief justice within few days in his lecture by saying that keshwanand bharti is a north star which guides the judiciary because why this is very important in the context of constitutionalism this judgment of course the this this is the only case in the history of indian uh, in indian supreme court where all 13 at that time the total strength was 13 judges all 13 judges sat and the case was decided there are various uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, views or opinions given by different uh, judges and it took 10 years or 15 years the many scholars were even uh, discussing as to what is ultimately the ratio because many have given their judgment so what what the majority has decided and what we, what can be called out as a ratio but i think uh, the uh, 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 salutary contribution of justice h r khanna who tilted the balance and uh, because of that we can uh, uh, say what kalkeshwanand bharti decides but the most important aspect of the judgment was the propounding of basic structure uh, doctrine and uh, on which there was uh, a criticism and i denounced that criticism myself very very strongly uh, so that this judgment declares that some features of the indian constitution like democracy federalism rule of law judicial independence separation of powers were inalienable means actually constitution can be amended article 368 of the constitution gives power to the parliament to amend the constitution by of course two third majority but they say that all these provisions in the constitutions are unamendable that is the court said that even to parliament cannot amend these even in exercise of powers under 368 that is why there is a criticism also why parliament should not be given that but i feel that this is a judgment and which has been applied there after time and again which has saved our democracy in this country and uh, uh, of course a period came we know emergency and uh, adm jabalpur the judgment which was decided at that time uh, rights were taken away and uh, uh habeas corpus the people were put behind bars nine high courts where the uh, habeas corpus petitions were filed by those that for no reason we are uh, our freedom is taken away and it uh, violates article 21 of the constitution nine high courts decided and issued uh, writ of uh, habeas corpus saying that these persons are uh, wrongly uh, taken into custody and they should be released but the supreme court unfortunately that's it always treated as one of the darkest period of indian judiciary overturned that judgment uh, with the 4 is to 1 and saying that no during emergency even the fundamental rights are suspended so of course the uh, it was immediately taken care of constitutional amendment was passed the judgment was undone but um, it's a very interesting thing that uh, Uh, in that bench justice senior justice chandrachud was also a party and he has been overruled by his son now and this judgment uh, stands overruled officially although uh, maybe it was not required in the sense as i said that the judgment uh, uh, i mean had been uh, constitutionally overruled by constitutional amendment but i think that present chief justice wanted to send that message that keshwanand bharti is there it would remain and uh the fundamental rights are so cherished that they cannot be taken away at any time and so uh, in that uh, uh, the, the judgment given salutary judgment which is handed down by uh the present chief justice now uh i would say that immediately after the if you see the history 
immediately after this adm jabalpur when the emergency was lifted and the government changed uh, the supreme court uh, came out in a different avatar and a different role altogether and that is a era from 78 to mid 80s or rather late uh, 80s and which continues even today is that where the supreme court really uh, expanded the scope of human rights expanded uh, and came out heavily uh, whenever the concept of limited government came and uh, said that you cannot do one thing or the other and the first judgment thereafter if i would say uh, is that uh, menka gandhi versus union of india which is again a landmark because of two reasons number one not only about the rights human rights etc but the uh, 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 reading due process in article 21 in instead of process only and uh, overruling gopalan versus state of madras which was 1950 judgment so that becomes a landmark and thereafter uh, the era of uh, public interest litigation which started and uh, uh, of course we can say today that there are it, the, uh, the the uh, i mean it's a process which is misused also but public interest litigation is one uh, whereby uh, again i would say part 4 or positive aspect of constitutionalism and working towards the welfare of the constitution uh, 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 this uh, welfare of the state uh, has been a great instrument uh, if we take a full stock of uh, what pil is and uh, in state of uh, uttaranchal versus uh, balwan singh uh, Uh, judgment justice uh, uh, bandari dalbir bandari uh, he uh, recounted that the pil has gone um, uh, how from one stage to other there the three phases he counts phase 1 it deals with the cases in where the directions and orders were passed primarily to protect the fundamental rights of marginalized groups and sections of the society under article 21 uh, who because of extreme poverty illiteracy and ignorance could not approach the supreme court or the high courts pil started with that extending uh, the scope of uh, locus and i <coughs> phase 2 he recounts is it deals with the cases relating to protection preservation of ecology environment forest maritime wildlife mountains rivers historical that is environmental issues which came through pil etc green setting off of green bench which still continues and uh, so therefore and and treating environment as fundamental right and uh, enlarging the scope and creating that kind of jurisprudence i have gone to various uh, courts uh, in other countries also me and professor rajkumar were together in uh, supreme court of hawaii and uh, we had uh, this uh, on environment um, they, uh, and they were also saying that look the contribution of indian supreme court and indian uh, green uh, national green tribunal is stupendous and it is today emulated throughout the world the kind of jurisprudence which is created and third phase <coughs> deals with the directions now this is interesting direction issued by the courts in maintaining the probity transparency and integrity of in governance so many cases have come and here the thin lines and where the debate starts whether the supreme court is acting it is a over activism or they should uh, uh, and they are transgressing into the uh, 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 powers uh, or uh, the field of uh, executive or the legislature sometime issuing direction in the form of uh, uh, which which amounts to making the law or which is the function assigned to and that is but the uh, I, i would say main purpose uh, of mo- most of these judgments is let me be very frank and have a caveat that yes i accept supreme court has many times transgressed it should not have in some cases where it the field totally belongs to the executive or legislature may not have gone to that extent but at the same time many times these interventions which have come and most of these cases which would uh, show that it has tried to bring the probity and uh, the the uh, better governance to ensure better governance in the country and uh, uh i have seen many scholars many professors many lawyers and judges from other jurisdiction who sometimes wonder how indian supreme court can pass such kind of orders this this totally belongs to executive and they should not do so but going by 
the Indian conditions, I would say, and sometimes to protect the rule of law, these may be necessary. But ultimately, what should be the approach? Uh, I mean, uh, and and this debate of. Uh, uh, judicial activism and judicial pragmatism, whether it is judicial activism or it is judicial pragmatism, that uh, uh, I should not be a judge who should be totally conservative judge, who only looks into the letter of law and wants to decide. Uh, Professor Srijit mentioned about uh, the originalism, uh, and th this is the debate which is going on in America today, whether a constitution which came 250 years ago whether today we should and uh, we feel in this part of the world and India as but in particularly that the constitution is a living organ and uh, uh, it grows uh, with the time the time which was in 1947 today we are living in a totally different world and in America that in uh, uh, 1776 that time and today 2020-23 is totally different world but there there's still that debate is going on and there are many conservatives who think that no what because constitution is what was conceived at the time and we should adhere to that meaning only i would say for, for uh, uh, that may not be good for the democracy or rule of law and i have in this uh, given my ideas about this constitution that what should be ultimately the approach in respect of judicial activism or judicial overreach is concerned and uh, i would not go to uh, that far and uh, say all this but uh, let me uh, say at the end, uh, uh, after mentioning those two roles again, uh, how far Indian judiciary has been successful in uh, uh, attaining those goals. But uh, uh, I, I end with this, that the judges have a no North Star that guides them the fundamental values and principles of constitutional democracy. If these are kept in mind, an activist judiciary would be capable of adhering to the principles of constitutional democracy, thereby protecting not only democracy but the rule of law, contribute towards welfareism for the upliftment of the society, while at the same time maintaining the constitutional balance by adhering to the principles of separation of powers and not crossing the Lakshman Rekha. Undoubtedly, it is a delicate task which the judiciary is supposed to perform and the constitutional vision of justice becomes a perfect guide for the judiciary to achieve this cherished goal. Undoubtedly, it is the role of judiciary to safeguard the aforesaid interest of the people and their dignity. At the same time, it is also to be recognized that judiciary has its own limitation in a regime governed by separation of powers. It is also seen that there have been attempts from time to time to undermine the independence of judiciary and to create a politicized judiciary. In the constitutional democracy, India has witnessed some interesting moments in the last 70 years and has emerged stronger, which I said. In the process, civil society in the shape of we the people remain the backbone of the successful uh, of the success of social contract regime created by people for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Sikri. The floor is now open for questions. You may ask questions to Justice Sikri. All right, uh, that was a comprehensive 24 on the evolution of constitutionalism and rule of law and access to justice and democracy and indeed judiciary. So the floor is open. Uh, yeah, please. We'll take two, three questions together and then uh, request him to <laughs> answer. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, your lecture got me thinking of, uh, you know, this research paper I'm writing about. Uh, so I was uh, recently researching about the decriminalization of 377. I, I was reading the judgment again. And in that, uh, CJ Deepak Mishra had opined that popular morality cannot dictate constitutional rights. And while reading that and listening to the lecture, I got uh, thinking about, you know, what has been happening in the country of late about, uh, you know, with respect to fundamental rights and uh, especially Section 19, 1A of the Constitution. So uh, 
I would want to think uh, that not about the separation of judiciary, uh, legislative or executive, but from the perspective of we, the people of India, when we talk about social consciousness and constitutionalism, I want to ask whether you think that social consciousness and the changing of social consciousness can further affect how we perceive constitutionalism, and because of that, uh, you know, can it affect the basic structure itself? Because constitutionalism, you know, uh, basic structure is based on constitutionalism. So with the, uh, you know, uh, the way people start thinking, if they start thinking in a different manner, if uh, negative uh, attributes of constitutionalism are overrided and e only the positive ones come forward with how the society is being shaped of late. So uh, do you think that would also create a, uh, you know, uh, effect on how constitution yeah, is I, I think it's a very interesting question uh, about social uh, consciousness of the people. Uh, the basic thing is what is what amounts to social consciousness of people. I think here we are talking about what majority feels. They think that this is social conscience and that is what the essence of my entire lecture was. That yes, but majoritarianism doesn't mean that we give way to constitutionalism or uh, uh, democratic principles. And therefore, I said that uh, the negative attributes, you are very right. This debate will always go on, uh, uh, negative versus uh, positive constitutionalism. When I said about after Second World War, the, uh, that uh, section of uh, the jurist who talked about the uh, positive uh, constitutionalism, they in fact criticized. Uh, the negative constitution. They didn't say, this is my theory that both should coexist. They rather went to the extent, no, it's only the welfare of the people at large which has to be seen and therefore governments should be elected, government should be given every power to show. But then this, there is a presumption in it that if such a power is given, they will, the government will act only for the welfare of the people, which may not be true. Particularly, there, there may be governments which may act for the welfare of the people, but at the same time, you cannot crush minorities. You cannot crush uh, uh, freedom of speech. You cannot crush liberty of the people. So therefore, negative uh, constitutionalism is also as important as positive constitutionalism. And as I said, it is a balance to be maintained. But yes, when now the question comes uh, about the social conscience, now question is in a given situation, when the case comes before the court, whether the court has to be gone, uh, would go by the, uh, I mean, popular uh, uh, perception, which is populist, which is happening, or what the constitution commands. And I think we are wedded to the constitution. It is the constitution which is supreme. It is the constitution which is our religion. And therefore, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, and when I say that the constitution, uh, the uh, I mean, judiciary is to protect the constitution, it is constitutional values, which doesn't mean, and that is why if you remember, I mentioned about balancing the two aspects of constitutionalism as well. So it will depend upon the uh, uh, facts of a particular case that how it is to be balanced. Yeah. All right, let's take more questions. Yeah, please. Respected Justice, thank you for the wonderful lecture. I am Raj Kapil, serving as lecturer in JGLS from criminology background. My question is, we have Article 15, Directive Principles of State Policy, talking about separation of judiciary from the executive. And uh, my understanding is that we have uh, had s more than 75 years from independence, and I think some of the rights should move from DPSP to the <coughs> part three, or fundamental rights part. So with reference to Article 50, in the near future, or at least by 2047, can we take this article, Article 50, into Part 3, so that the current system of appointment of judges, the collegium system, could be brought as a uh, fundamental right, so that at some point of time, it could also be brought under the basic structure? Because what I feel is the attack on judiciary is the attack on the democratic citizens of the nation. Your view on that, respect. Right. Can we take a couple of more, sir? We can remember. Yeah, there's a question right, right there. Thank you so much for your lecture. My you can use the mic, please. My question comes from a topical lens, but it's not about social conscience, but about judicial conscience. Uh, and I ask from the lens of, say, bail jurisprudence. While, yes, the Supreme Court has expanded 
after 1970s uh, expanded our ambit of how we pursue constitutionalism, the, uh, the importance, and the judiciary has taken a higher, a very substantive role on that. But we don't see that divulging down to the lower rungs of, my apologies, subordinate judiciary. W uh, my question is basically this, how have we landed ourselves in this position and how do you see the judicial conscience in this aspect could better in the coming years? Thank you. One more and then, yeah, there's a question from there. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you for the enlightening lecture, sir. My question is regarding the Nalsa judgment and the Transgender Persons Act, which came out in 2019. Uh, the judgment clarified how self-determination of gender is essential, but the act which came in 2019 places dependence on sex reassignment surgery and doesn't provide reservation for, for transgender persons. What are your views on that? Okay. Yeah, coming to the first question, uh, which you asked about the I mean, some of the directive principles and Article 50 particularly. Actually, uh, let me tell you here, uh, it is an, it's going to be an unending debate uh, of, as far as judicial appointment in this country are concerned. Very interestingly, when NGAC judgment came, many uh, great scholars also criticized that judgment saying that, look, uh, and this is also a plausible, I won't say a wrong view, uh, 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 I mean, equally strong view, I would say, that why judges should appoint judges. This happens only in India, correct? And uh, uh, so I elsewhere, anywhere in the world, the appointment of judges process is totally different. And in America, it is almost uh, political process. And so therefore, that is one view. And therefore, they say that no, uh, the uh, executive should have say, at least some say, in the appointment. That is one view. Other view is totally which NGAC judgment also depicted or showed that, look, independence of judiciary, if you were, it, it is entire judgment is based on independence of judiciary, which is, again, a basic feature of the Constitution, as said in Kashwan and the Bharti also. So if we have any other mode, so independent of judiciary would be, uh, I mean, compromised. I don't know whether that would happen or that would not happen is, again, a matter of debate. But at the same time, histories have shown there are certain periods, uh, and you can understand what I am saying, certain periods uh, in the history which have shown that, look, independence of judiciary has to be cherished. Because when the, 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 the executive tries to politicize the judicial system, and therefore, it is better to have this. And I have seen the, uh, uh, the debate which started in recent time, some of those jurists I am saying who were uh, against NJAC judgment, they now have started saying no, that is better. But my, my, my uh, only I mean, uh, purpose of saying all this is, as I said in the beginning, that this is a debate. It's a very, very deb highly debatable issue. And therefore, it is totally unlikely that it becomes fundamental right. Totally unlikely. But in so far as, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, your question generally, not limited to this aspect, but if you see again, uh, and I have said in uh, uh, one or two of my articles also, uh, this is a very interesting uh, transition, or rather this is a judicial uh, interpretation of the constitutional provision. Some of the directive principles of the state policy about welfare of the state. They are part of constitutionalism, I said. But then, when they are par part four, that is not justiciable. That is not enforceable. But then many of these aspects are brought into as facets of Article 21 and Article 14 and have been enforced. So this is, again, a great contribution of Indian judiciary, the way it has happened. And uh, therefore, we need not even uh, think of uh, bringing some of the uh, uh, provisions of directive principles into fundamental rights. Where it can happen, it is happening. And even in the case of judicial appointment, I would say, but independent of judiciary as a uh, basic feature, etc., of the constitution, same thing is achieved. 
second uh, was asked by about the judicial conscience, you said. Actually, it's a very interesting question. You are right. Uh, what happens is uh, uh, in India, I mean, I'm not talking of, uh, again, uh, lower judiciary. You asked in that context. Many times the perception is among uh, judges in the lower judiciary that insofar as constitution is concerned, what is to be done about it, how it is to be enforced, etc. This is all, it's a forte which belongs to high, court and high courts and Supreme Court. Because in order to enforce fundamental rights or in uh, order to enforce any public remedy, you have to go to high court under 226 or Supreme Court under 32. What we have to do with the constitution? That is the wrong perception which many judges have. Because uh, I always feel that this constitution, uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, as far as the constitution is concerned, uh, the role of the judge, even as a district court, going by the ethos of the constitution, the principles of the constitution, that is their role as well. I give you a very simple example. First, take case of a bail which is nowadays again, uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, talked about and it becomes a matter of debate again and again, or at least discussion again and again, where bails are denied to many people for long or given to some other pe persons, etc. But I always say, if a person deserves bail and he is not given, even today, suppose bail application is filed before a magistrate or before a session judge and he gives a notice to the prosecution, say, come after 10 days or 12 days. Now, if for these 10, 12 days, even if he gives bail after 10, 12 days, if that means he thinks that the person should have been granted bail, keeping in, in jail or in custody for 10 or 12 days, you have deprived him of his personal liberty. And it is the court which has violated Article 21 of the Constitution. So you should have that kind of uh, awareness, that kind of consciousness while discharging. And uh, much is, uh, now we have judicial academies. There's a national judicial academy for the training of judges. There are, uh, in all state judicial academies are there. We keep, I, I have been going very regularly as, uh, uh, I mean, when I was judge and even now also. And uh, uh, for training of the judges, we uh, try to imbibe these constitutional values in them and try to say that what is your function as a judge and what is your duties towards the society as a judge uh, in order to do justice. We hope, and I would say that there are many very, very good judges as well. They are, uh, and I'm very frank in saying that sometimes, and many judges I found in district judiciaries who may be better than many high court judges. But at the same time, yes, you are right, uh, vast number of judges, they lack this perception. And it is the awareness or it is the proper judicial training which can uh, bring all this. And uh, uh, there was one more question. Uh, no, they yeah. It was about the Nalsa judgment. Ah, yeah, Nalsa. Actually, no, you are right. Uh, I'm the author of that judgment, Nalsa judgment. I, along with Justice uh, <coughs> uh, uh, this Radha Krishnan, we uh, wrote that judgment. Of course, you are right. What we wanted and the kind of rights we wanted to give, uh, all that have not been taken care of and are in, uh, included in this act. One thing is good, let me be very frank. It was again maybe an act of judicial activism in the sense that where we said in, uh, uh, that till the time law is brought, this would be the law. And uh, in a way, you are legislating. But two, two cases I see in my history and, and where the uh, courts have done uh, such an act. Uh, one was uh, that uh, case of uh, uh, sexual harassment at workplaces where the, uh, uh, the, the uh, court said that uh, this would be the law till the time law is enacted. It took 15, 20 years, I think, uh, for the legislature to enact the law. But coming to this uh, transgender, uh, two very important things which happened that within I think couple of years 2016 or 17 is judgment 2019 uh, law was enacted within two three years the law came at least 
some of the rights are recognized. Number one, although you are right, transgenders are not very happy with this law. They think that much more is uh, needed. Number two, this is the only law where private bill, which was introduced, which became law. In 75 years, no private bill introduced by any private any MP, which became law. But we feel, we hope that there may be amendment and some more rights are given, yeah. as it has happened in the case of Disability Act from 99, uh, 99 Act, then thereafter 2017 Act, 16 Act. Uh, I mean, there's a sea change. So let us hope. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Secretary, for your very insightful words and thoughtful discourse. Before we move on, uh, I request our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Raj Kumar, to felicitate our chief guest and the members of Dr. H. R. Bharadwaj, the family of the Dr. H. R. Bharadwaj. I request Dr. Raj Kumar to felicitate Mrs. Prafullata Bharatwaj. I request Dr. Raj Kumar to felicitate Mr. Arun Bharatwaj. I request the family members of Dr. I request Professor Raj Kumar to felicitate Mr. Karan Bharadwaj. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Palvi Bharadwaj. and Mr. Gautam Bhalwaj. <laughs> now I invite Mr. Arun Bharadwaj, son of Dr. H.R. Bharadwaj, to share a few words with us. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My Lord Justice Sikri, former Judge, Supreme Court of India, and currently Judge of the Singapore Commercial Court, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Sahib, uh, Professor Rajkumar, Professor Professor Srijit, uh, Madam Nair, my mother, uh, who is also sitting here, in spite of being about 86 year old, she said that it is an emotional moment for me. So I would personally like to come on this auspicious occasion. My young friends, brothers and sisters, uh, my dear professor colleagues here, all those who are teaching here. So, first of all, I would like to share a very uh, personal and emotional moment, which is now I'm experiencing. This is really an emotional and very special moment for me and my family. Because I remember, as Professor Saab said, on 10th August 2006, he first time met my father. And that was the time this idea of setting up a global university, I think it was discussed by them. And on one or two occasions, I also happened to be there and I sat with them for a cup of tea. And I overheard this discussion and I, it is really a miracle that within a period of three years, from 2006 till 2009 September, the operation started with a very small facility. Now, as I am told today, there are about 10,000 students and 4 million square feet of area which is there in a period of almost, you can imagine how many, 15, 16 years. So that's a great, creditable achievement. And for that, I would like to congratulate Professor Bhardwaj and all other persons who were involved in building of this great institution. It's really a remarkable job. And it is, according to me, should be an eye-opener and a lesson to others that how to start this kind of a global university setup. In fact, my own younger son also uh, studied here. And I'm proud to see the kind of values which he has uh, inculcated here and the knowledge. So that is what 
uh, I am saying. The second thing is regarding the uh, erudite lecture, memorial lecture with my Lord Justice Sikri has given. In fact, I had the pleasure and uh, of appearing by, before Justice Sikri when he was in High Court. In Supreme Court, I couldn't uh, appear much. But fact of the matter is, Justice Sikri has been al always very polite and very patient in hearing arguments by the councils. So that gave a lot of encouragement to, at that time when I was a young lawyer, I remember he was in court number 19, and the last case with Justice Call, Sanjay Call, who is now sitting uh, Supreme Court judge, did as a lawyer, was before Justice Sikri's court, and I was a counsel in that matter for another colleague. So I am carrying these special moments with me. And also the erudite lecture with Professor Savgib, Vice Chancellor Savgib, that, that was also heart touching. It was really very touching that everyone is here today to give uh, this kind of a respect and uh, to my father. So for, as far as I am concerned, my family members are concerned, my mother is here. We are all very grateful to the OP Jindal Global University and also my dear friend Mr. Jindal. In fact, whenever we meet, you always tell me that, well, it is because of your father that we have this university, which has now been recognized as the institution of global eminence. And it is not only by its uh, matter of words, but it is, it does mean, it does mean a lot, and it is actually fulfilling its title. So for that also, I congratulate the staff who have, uh, who have made this all, all this possible. Now, this lecture which my Lord Justice uh, Sikri gave, it was, believe me, it's like you are seeing constitution yourself. And as a student of law, uh, when I used to study law, international politics and other things, comparative constitution, rights part three of the constitution, which is now basic structure of the constitution, particularly after the latest judgment of Keshavan and Bharati case. Prior to that, there was, there was Goloknath case, Minervam Bill case and so on. So basically now as a student, you all should know one thing, that article part 3 of the constitution, our constitution has 25 parts and 12 schedules. So as part 3 of the constitution is now declared as the basic structure of the constitution, nobody under the, earth, uh, under the sun can change this part 3, even the parliament cannot do it, the debates are still going on, but I think this basic structure will definitely remain same. And basic structure contains right to equality, right to freedom, to do, to carry on business, speech, etc., etc. And uh, so with all these things, I think this lecture must have benefited all of you. And now you must be a little more enlightened than you were before. And you will go as a different kind of a student, knowing, having a lot of knowledge about our constitution, about judiciary and uh, uh, democracy. So with that, I would like to thank Professor Saab, uh, Justice Sikri, and uh, Madam Nair, Professor Srinath, and also Mr. Patnaik, and everybody, all those who are present here, for making this occasion possible in memory of my father and organizing this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. I invite the Registrar of OP Jindal Global University, Professor Dabru Sridhar Patnaik, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Maneka. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's indeed a special day. Uh, you uh, learned about the life and times of Mr. H.R. Bharadwaj, so there uh, cannot be a proper tribute and a homage than to have a distinguished public lecture in his memory, and that is the way forward to learn about the law, to learn about uh, public policy, to learn about governance and all his contributions to uh, public life. And we are so glad that uh, Justice Sikri, a dear friend and mentor of the university, has kindly accepted to deliver the lecture uh, this afternoon. Uh, in fact, uh, it's only befitting uh, to have this uh, particular theme of the lecture, uh, considering the life and works of uh, Mr. Uh, H.R. Bharadwaj, uh, to whom uh, education is so very central. Uh, to democracy and uh, alongside it's also very important uh, to have uh, uh, empowerment of uh, girl child and women and it's only axiomatic that his values 
uh, they were so much in consonance with the values even espoused by uh, Sri O. P. Jindal, uh, the father of our benefactor, in whose name we set up this university. And Mr. Navin Jindal also champions these values uh, because education is so very central, and they all believe that students are the change makers. So we are so glad that it's been an amazing confluence of values today uh, on this uh, delightful and even an auspicious day uh, we could have this uh, lecture and we are also grateful uh, to the family members of Sri H.R. Bharadwaj uh, for their uh, support ever since as uh, wonderfully uh, narrated by our Vice Chancellor. Uh, we are grateful to uh, Madam uh, Mrs. Uh, Prafullata Bharadwaj uh, for her support in setting up this uh, particular uh, endowed lecture and series of other uh, activities as part of this framework uh, to which we are fully committed and we are also thankful to uh, the family members that includes uh, Mr. Uh, Arun Bharadwaj whom you just heard, uh, Mrs. Vindya Bharadwaj, uh, the wife of Mr. Arun Bharadwaj and their sons uh, Karan and Gautam and Ms. Pallavi Bharadwaj uh, who is the wife of Karan Bharadwaj uh, who joined us this afternoon and made this a momentous occasion uh, to all of us. Uh, we are also grateful to Mr. Arun Bharadwaj, not only for having, uh, along with Madam Prafulata Bharadwaj, curated uh, this entire framework of action, uh, but also for having donated uh, 500 important works and uh, from the personal library of Sri uh, H.R. Bharadwaj, uh, who in fact steered the entire setting up of the university and it's a great honor for us to have uh, his legacy uh, to continue in this manner. Uh, we are also thankful uh, to the Jinder Global Law School uh, led by Professor Sri Rajkumar and Professor Srijit and all the assistant deans in particular for having made this afternoon a possibility and I must tell you all students that it's a great honor to be here and to listen to the a uh, wonderful and insightful lecture by Justice uh, Arjun K. Sikri, uh, who has not only been guiding us and our students, uh, but even all the visiting students uh, coming to the JGLS and to the JGU. So on this particular note, I end my remarks, but I thank all the students and even all the departments that made this afternoon a possibility, including the staff members of the Office of the Vice Chancellor and the Registrar. Thank you all so much. Please remain seated while the dignitaries leave the Performing Arts Academy.